movement during that time as well. Impact on New Orleans, impact on the Gulf South region, but also impact on community engaged art in general and on African American art in general. So it's a lot of things for around this panel. So we have, we're really, I'm really proud to say we have so many amazing voices here to talk about this subject. And for this panel, um, they're, our, our panelists are going to start with some opening statements and opening reflections. But what I'd really like to do is, is give a lot of time to the audience for audience questions. So as they're talking, please be thinking of questions. And I expect a lot of people to line up at the mic and engage with us um, and towards the end of the second half of the panel. Um, so be taking notes, and I hope everybody has some questions. I know you will, because there's so many experts on this topic in the room as well. There's some here on the can be up here with us. So, I'm going to start by, I have a little introduction for each panelist. So, um, that's what I want to offer you guys today as we think about the FST's impact. My first panelist up here is, um, I'll introduce you and then kind of let you give your opening thoughts. And then after that, I'll introduce the next panelist and so forth and so forth that way will be a little cohesion with who's, who they are and where and what their statements are. So our first panelist is Kalama Yassalam. Kalama, as most of you know, is an FST alumni and was co-director of the Black Art South Performance and Writing Collective, which is a part of the Free Southern Theater in its um, iteration in New Orleans after it moved from Mississippi to here. During his time in the FST, Kalama wrote numerous plays, including Mama, Black Love Song Number no. One and the Destruction of the American Stage, and many others. He was also co editor with Tom Dent of Combo, FST's literary journal, which he published for several years. In the years since, Kalama has organized and led numerous writing workshops, building on the FST's participatory aesthetic, uh, including Students at the Center, a writing program in New Orleans public schools, which he, of which he's currently co director and the Neo Brio Workshop, a black writer's workshop focusing on text, recordings, and videos. Colombo also served for 13 years as the editor of the Black Collegiate Magazine. He was the co-founder of Renegade Media, a publishing company, leader of The Word Band, a poetry performance ensemble, and moderator of eDrum. A lot of you may be on this. It's a listserv for black writers. Um, and, and he's also a co-moderator with his son, Tume, of The Breath of Life, a conversation with black music. For several years, years way back, Columbo is also the executive director of the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, and he's published numerous books and anthologies, such as The Blues Merchant, the 1969 Poetry Collection, What is Life, Reclaiming the Black Blues Self, Tarzan Cannot Return to Africa, But I Can, Our Women, Keep Our Skies From Falling, Six Essays in the Support of the Struggle to Smash Sexist and Develop Women, Smash Sexism and Develop Women, Our Music Is No Accident, and the Poetry Anthology, 360 Degrees, A Revolution of Black Poets, and of course, also, The Magic of Juju, an Appreciation of the Black Arts Movement. Klam has traveled around the world as a journalist and music producer and has published more articles than it's possible to count on topics ranging from New Orleans and African diaspora, music and culture, to African American literature, to oral histories. He's also known for his numerous films and spoken word CDs. Kalamu serves as a mentor for many, many creative writers and scholars in New Orleans and around the U.S. and the world, especially me. So that's why I want to really give a good introduction to him here. If it weren't for the thousands of hours that Kalamu spent patiently training me and guiding me in my research, my teaching, and my writing, I would not be here today. Currently, Kalamu is editing the Tom Dent Reader, an anthology of Tom Dent's little known and some unpublished works. It promises to be my absolute favorite book ever. <laughs> Good afternoon. I joined the Free Sun Theater in 1968. and was an active member all the way through the early 70s. I'd just like to mention uh, briefly three things and hopefully hear from the other panelists and the members yeah. of the audience. Yeah, it's the same. Seems First, this question of uh, art. What were we doing and 
what is being done and the impact of the FST. The question is a policy question, a question that is put out by petty bourgeoisie and the careers. Yeah, I'm going to go there. Uh, John, don't laugh at your friends. <laughs> Who have to find a way in their own minds to justify being artists full time without being involved in the political struggles of the day. Period. That's what that shit is about. About it because we came through the movement, we were active, we intended to stay active, as we also made art, and our art, of course, would reflect that. But if you didn't come through that, if you've never been a part of political struggle, then this just seems completely out the box, and that's. Remains the question today with arts, with the arts. Who are you as a person? And if your life off the stage ain't about shit, your life on the stage ain't gonna be about shit. I bring it in the hard way like that because that's the only way it sometimes gets understood to cut through a lot of the 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 if you will, obfuscations, to use one of the words. One of the obfuscations that are inherent in a lot of the theoretical discussion about the nature of the arts. As though the arts have a nature. Arts are not a nature. Those are ideas that come from human beings. That's where the nature is in those human beings. Ideas don't have a nature in and of themselves. The human beings who think of those ideas have a nature. And if we want to discuss aesthetics and so forth and so on, basically what we're doing is discussing the human beings who are putting forth those notions. There's no such thing as beauty in and of itself. There are human beings who think some things are beautiful and some things are not. All right, second thing I wanted to talk about, since we finish with that, <laughs> I am, I am. <laughs> the second thing I wanted to talk about in terms of impact, nobody in this society, the American society, and it's been made crystal clear this past couple of weeks, Nobody wants to pay for something being relevant and questioning society. James Ball was told us that long time ago. Society really educates us to be compliant, does not educate us to question. And to the degree that we begin questioning society and ourselves, to that same degree we become a problem. Well, for many of us in the Free Southern Theater during the, the late 60s and throughout the 70s, we were asking questions posing questions to ourselves. Sometimes the questions were suspect, we used to say with love. They might have been some of the questions were suspect, but we were always asking questions. And hence we were a problem. The question of where we're gonna get the money from to fund this remains the major question. Major question for the arts. Major question for anything. The reptiles in charge in Washington, D.C. These motherfuckers, look what they did. They said, we do not have the votes. This is a democracy. We do not have the votes. So how will we deal with this and still be a democracy? Simply, we'll change the rules. We now change the rules so we don't have to vote. How the fuck you gonna have a democracy and the rule is you don't have to vote? Anyway. <laughs> these issues are right now. This is where these issues are. So this issue about how will we fund the arts 
How will we fund the arts? Damn, you just take one missile and fund all the damn arts that you've been funded for the last 10 years. And I'm telling you what I know, because when I was in the Army, I was nuclear missile, electronic repair person, all the nuclear warhead and all that shit. I know what it takes to do that stuff. I was trained in doing that stuff. And I know they got more nuclear missiles than they know what to do with. And they can take one of those nuclear missiles and pay for all the arts programs the NEA has done. So that's, that's <laughs> I'm not lobbying for applause, but I'm just telling you the facts of life. Um, the third thing is that we were trying to bring the arts into the community, not understanding that careerism, that is making a career out of being a professional artist, does not go, look out your own big duck in the house. <laughs> um, what does not go hand in hand? You cannot, you cannot develop an art that asks questions on the dollar that wants you to provide only answers. Now you may not understand this, let me repeat it so you get it. You cannot do this, develop art that asks questions on the dollar when people only want you to provide answers. Because the assumption with providing an answer is that you know what's going on and you therefore cease inquiry into the community. The one who asks questions of everybody in the community to find out what's going on and what needs to be done, if you go about it that way, then you're going to end up being against the status quo because the status quo is making money off of the oppression and exploitation of the community and the people whose ass are getting kicked, they know that they ass is getting kicked. They may not understand exactly how it works, but they know that. And if you keep asking those questions, you won't be sitting at Tulane having a conference. You'll be having the conference someplace else. And that was always a problem with, with FST. Where will we be housed? I'm through. <laughs> Okay, thanks so much. Um, building on that, um, our next <laughs> panelist. <laughs> Take it to the next level. <laughs> Put you off sleep and take a little nap for a while. Well, pulling back a little bit, we have here um, historian Jim Smethurst, um, who's done a great deal of research, um, really grounding himself in the details um, and the um, ideas behind organizations like the Free Session Theater, but not just the FSC, um, the Black Arts Movement as, as a broader whole. But um, he's been inspiring to me because he was one of the first scholars to really recognize um, the Black Arts Movement wasn't anchored only in New York or LA, that it, was, it actually had a very strong anchor and it was, it was very grounded in the work that was going on in New Orleans in the late 1960s. So, Jim Smethers, Dr. Smethers teaches Afro-American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of The New Red Negro, The Literary Left in African-American Poetry, 1930-1946, as well as The Black Arts Movement, Literary Nationalism in the 1960s and 70s, which was the winner of the Organization of American Historians James A. Raleigh Prize. And he's also written The African-American Roots of Modernism, From Reconstruction to the Harlem Renaissance. He's the co-editor of Left of the Color Line, Race, Radicalism in 20th Century Literature in the United States, and Radicalism in the South Since Reconstruction. Just some great chapters on the FST in it. He's currently working on the forthcoming SOS, Calling All Black People, a Black Arts <coughs> Movement Reader, with historian John Bracey and poet, playwright, and activist Sonia Sanchez. 
and he's also working on a history of the Black Rights Movement in the South. So with that, I give you Dr. Smithers. Okay, being the academic after, uh, oh, good afternoon, by the way. It is afternoon, yes, yes. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bore you all. You can take a little nap for a while after Columbus worked, worked your way up. But I just wanted to, I mean, I actually have to say I'm really honored and odd kind of to be here. Uh, it's kind of uh, to talk about the Free Southern Theater and its uh, legacy, its importance, with all these folks from the Free Southern Theater in the room. Seems a little presumptuous, but I'll, I'll do the best I can and then get it out of the way and let other folks speak. I, you know, a few things, you know, basically a couple things that I wanted to say is, you know, one, obviously one way in which the Free Southern Theater is really important is simply chronologically. You know, I think you can make a pretty good case. I mean, there were radical theaters, black theaters, before the Free Southern Theater. However, I think you can make a pretty good case that the Free Southern Theater was really the first black radical theater of the 1960s uh, with a wide sort of circulation uh, out of the black liberation movement. So I, I, you know, this is before the black arts repertory theater in school, this is before a lot of stuff. So I think that, you know, strictly in terms of, uh, you know, chronological, uh, Primacy, you have to you have to say that this is an incredible. You know, you could if one was going to say when does the Black Arts Movement start? There's a lot of answers to that, but you know, one of those answers could be, or one of those places would be the free. Even though they weren't thinking of themselves in that way, was the founding of the Free Southern Theater uh, in Mississippi and then moving to New Orleans. So I think it's a, it's incredibly. We can't forget that. I think that that's something that's worth, worth remembering, uh, just in terms of uh, historical primacy. But the other piece, which I think is the more, more important piece, at least in my mind, about the importance and legacy of the Free Southern Theater, with all its contradictions, all its, its conflicts, all its discussions, of which you're hearing a lot today, which would be true of almost any uh, radical uh, organization trying to do stuff uh, in the world, any kind of a movement that at least was thinking about revolution, uh, is uh, how the Free Southern Theater, in my mind, changed the whole landscape of theater and performance in the United States. What do I mean by that is that if you look at the Free Southern Theater and the organizations that develop out of the Free Southern Theater, its workshops, you know, led by people like Tom Dent, and I'm, I agree with Catherine, the idea that there's going to be a Tom Dent reader uh, is, is really so exciting to me about what, because he, he's so important in this, but uh, Tom Dent and Big Daddy Costly, and then morphing and then bringing in uh, younger people uh, like Kalamu, like Niall Watkins, uh, and then sort of morphing from that into Black Arts South, the rise of the journal and combo. And eventually, uh, again, a, a lot through the initiative of Tom Dent, working with people like uh, Jerry Ward, who was on the last panel, Wendell Narcisse in, in Miami, a whole range of people create the Southern Black Cultural Alliance, which was probably the most consequential, in my mind, the most successful black arts regional organization. Uh, for those of you who, I mean, some of the people here were in it and remember this, but for those of you who don't, this was an organization that had uh, theaters affiliated with it or inspired theaters all over the South. They had two conferences a year, I mean, it's like, Recall, I can be correct here. One was basically a showcase of theater. One was basically an organizational meeting. They covered the entire region. It went on for a long time, well into the 1980s. So this, you know, I think changed the face of of, of the South, the performance in the South, black performance in the South, and really, you know, changed the gra center of gravity for black theater and performance in the United States. Uh, now, it may be true that the theater industry is still based in New York City. It may be true 
that to sort of TV and film is still Los Angeles. But if you're talking about black theater, where is the center of black theater with all its weaknesses, perhaps, as, as, as Jerry Ward said, all its weaknesses in the United States? I would argue it's in the South. It's in places like Atlanta especially, but Nashville, Memphis, New Orleans, Houston, just to name a few. You know, uh, there, there are zillions. I mean, there are many, many black companies all through the South. How many are left in New York City? I live in Massachusetts. There really isn't a consistent company that functions year in and year out in Boston. It's an entirely different story down here with all the problems, with all the contradictions, with all the weaknesses. So I just want to say that if you want to say, well, how did this happen? Where did this come from? Especially moving, moving these theaters from their focus on campuses, Atlanta University Center, uh, Dillard and so forth, into communities. Well, you have to go back to the Free Southern Theater and everything that came out of the Free Southern Theater through John O'Neill, Doris Derby, uh, Denise Nicholas, uh, Tom Dent, Kalamu Yasalam uh, in Houston, the late Lorenzo Thomas, who came down from New York but found his way into these networks, Jerry, Jerry Ward, Chakula, Chachua, you know, you could go through a lot of different people, and that I think is something that you know. If we're thinking about the legacy of of the FST, it changed again. Whatever its shortcomings or contradictions, it changed a lot. segue into um, a little bit of history of the, the impact of the FST on the black arts movement and African American theater. The FST also was connected to a global network of community engaged radical theaters. Um, and so our next speaker, Jan Cohen Cruz, has written extensively about that and also done the work herself as a theater maker. Um, so it, I think it's just like what you're saying just really segues well into what I think Jan can tell us about the impact and the relationship of the FST to global forms of radical community engaged theater. So let me tell you a little bit about Jan. Jan is the editor of um, Public, a journal of Imagining America, which had its first issue just this past month, and I highly recommend everyone checking it out. Um, it's called Public, a journal of Imagining America. And she also directed Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in the Public Life from 2007 to 2012. She taught at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts from 1984 to 2006, founding the minor in applied theater there. She produced a community-based performance on community gardens, directed Cornerstone Theater's Sabrina Peck, and another Cornerstone Theater's Sabrina Peck, and another piece on gentrification, co-directed by Urban Bushelman's Jarrell Zolar and then my use Rosemary Quinn. In 2006-2007, Jan co-conceptualized and co-initiated Home New Orleans here in the city with faculty, students, artists, and other residents around New Orleans looking at art's role in the city's recovery from Katrina. Jan's written a book called Engaging Performance, Theater as Call and Response, and another influential book which talks a lot about the FST is her work, Local Acts, Community-Based Performance in the U.S. She's edited Radical Street Performance, another book, and Playing Wall Theater Therapy and Activism, as well as A Wall Companion. Jan's currently a university professor at Syracuse University, and she recently received a very well-deserved um, reward for, um, by the Association for Theater and Higher Education, um, gave her an award for leadership in community-based theater and civic engagement, which is a small testimony to her really big impact on that field across the country. Thank you. It, it really is an honor to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me to participate. Um, I'm going to try to make five points in five minutes, which is why I have a piece of paper in front of me. Uh, five points of some of the ways that I see um, FST's influence on theater for social equity. Um, one, FST manifested the power of people speaking for themselves. You know, there's a whole tradition of actors as interpreters. 
not real artists. And FST is an example of a company where y'all here were speaking what you cared about so clearly and what mattered to you. And this was part of a kind of progressive culture at the time. So I also want to just put FST in a little context in the early 60s. So the Living Theater, which by its very name is saying, we don't want this division between, as Kalama was talking about, who we are in the rest of our lives and what we do on a stage. Bread and Puppet Theater, it was, the anti it was the Vietnam War era, and a lot of the people in that company were very young, and either they were about to be drafted or their friends were. Um, El Teatro Campesino on the West Coast, of course, many of those people came right off the fields or their families were still in those fields doing this kind of theater. So they were speaking for themselves, about themselves, um, and, and their allies were speaking with them too. And this just snowballed, and it just continues <coughs> on and on through the 70s and 80s and 90s and even today. Um, number two, an extension of speaking for oneself is that expression is more important than technique. Technique can be learned. I mean, I remember Liz Lerman saying something like, yeah, it is great if a dancer takes her toe and touches it to her nose, but for her, if you see somebody 85 years old run across the stage into the arms of someone 18, that's kind of thrilling. So, and, and, and what's that about? What are those relationships? So, so what is it that, besides technique, makes for meaningful theater, and, it's, it, and it is this expression. And, and therefore, um, it seems very close when I look at what FST did, and the solidarity, obviously, with people struggling for civil rights, and doing the workshops, um, as well as plays. Because for many years, um, my sense in the US is people thought theater meant plays. So that was radical, that theater also meant workshops, that it meant the kind of educational projects that Doris was describing, that that was all of a piece. Um, and so it expanded for whom and where theater can take place. Um, the story Roscoe told, uh, this we heard earlier this morning, of, of making the play with the actors in Jonesboro, being ready for that moment because recognizing what John also spoke about, as this is about a dialogue. That's so much a part of something that's entered our culture that we have so much to thank FST for. Um, number three, there's a link between expressing aspirations and acting in the world. You know, as having, having directed an organization called Imagining America, we, you know, we thought a lot about what's the relationship between imagining and action and not wanting to live in a world or, or do work that left either one out. And I think FST is just a great example of a company that didn't leave either of those two out. Number four, the theater Theater as part of partnerships. That if you, there's so much idealism in theater, of all kinds of theater, and yet it's always kind of wacky to me, well, if you really want to make those changes in the world, why do you think that just getting up on a stage and saying it is enough? I mean, it's great, it's important, it's part of it, but the brilliance of being, you know, part of SNCC, Doris and John yourselves, and working with SNCC, and, how could you possibly have the kind of movement connections to get into the communities where you needed to perform? How could you have the analysis of once people were thinking critically, what's the next step towards action? How to make sure people could read so they could register to vote? That takes partnerships, and it's these partnerships with people who come from different fields. None of us can do it all. And I, I, I just look at, 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 at FST as a very great example. Um, of recognizing that and, and, and acting on that. Um, and then number five, that being in theater does not get us off the hook from everything else we are. Um, and that, it's like, we are still mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers and witnesses and victims and fighters and everything else. And again, it's, it's very much echoing what Kalamu said that you know, you don't leave the rest of your life behind. It's not like, oh, I'm an actor. I, I, this is how I contribute. I mean, it's got to be thought out a little better than that. And it's just been endlessly inspiring to me. And it's given me a lot of hope. Um, and, and even with the kind of, the way you especially, John, I've often heard you also cop to things where you didn't do everything the way you wanted to. And I think that's really important, too. Because if we wait till we're going to do it all right, we won't act. So, I, so I, I love that. I love that you'll talk about you know the things you're also not the proudest of that you've done, but you kept you kept on 
while we run this race because we don't want to do it in vain. Carlton Turner, who's a real example of powerful radical black theater today, working out of the blues and hip hop aesthetic, and, you know, inheriting the FST legacy. Um, Carlton's the executive director of Alternate Roots, a regional nonprofit arts organization based in the South, which John helped to start back in 1976. And Dudley. And Dudley, too. Yeah. So it's a, yeah. <laughs> Amazing organization. He's also co-founder and co-artistic director, along with his brother Maurice, of the group Mugabe, Men Under Guidance Acting Before Early Extinction, a performing arts group that blends jazz, hip-hop, spoken word poetry, and soul music together with non-traditional storytelling. Carlton's a published writer of poems, plays, essays, and editorials. His work has appeared in literary journals, Black Magnolias, Bridge Conversations, and Up From the Roots Journal, and many others. Carlton's on the board of Apple Shop and on the planning committee for the Association of Performing Arts Presenters. He's a member of the Free Southern Theater Institute's planning board named the Phoenix Squad and a member of the We Shall Overcome Fund Advisory Board at the Highlander Center. He's also a member of the planning advisory board for the Parents for Public Schools in Jackson, Mississippi. Carlton served on panels for Theater Communications Group, Arts Presenters Met Life Awards, the National Endowment for the Arts, Mississippi Arts Commission and Alternate Roots. He's currently participating in the Chief Executive Officer Program run by National Arts Strategies, a two-year professional development program for 100 nonprofit executives. And recently, Carlton was awarded the M. Edgar Rosenblum Award for Outstanding Contribution to Ensemble Theater by the Irondale Ensemble Project. Thanks, Carlton. How y'all doing this afternoon? So I just want to say I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and be a part of this conversation, especially with people that I know and admire, um, um, Jan and uh, Kalamu especially, uh, that I have had history with and have learned from. Um, so I really wanted to come to this conversation today as, a responding, as responding to what I hear the other panelists talk about because this is the history, this is my lesson, this is my education uh, to learn from these people who've been doing the work for so long. Um, I, I want to pick up where Kalamu left off and, and elevate the conversation a little bit to talk about our values. Um, and, and the work that we do in space is, is all about our values. What values are we bringing to the table as human beings? And how does it show up in the work that we do? So, you know, like Kalamu said, if, if you ain't about shit in your regular day, then who, you know, what are you going to do when you get on stage? I mean, that doesn't, it doesn't, you're just going to act like you're about some shit. You know what I'm saying? So like, what really are you bringing to that space? Um, and so I think a lot about values and, and the organizations that so many of us hide behind. Um, we, we talk about organizations the same way we talk about ideas, as if they exist on their own and that they can run around and, and that they're people. They're not people. Organizations aren't people. They're only as, as good as the people who occupy the positions that steward them and the values that those people possess. So one of the things I want to talk about just for a brief moment is that this week I was reading an article in The Independent which talked about the CIA and its usage of uh, abstract expressionism art uh, as a tactic in the Cold War. And, you know, not that I found that, uh, you know, revelatory, but what I found was really interesting is that the, the second line of that article was said that the CIA has had an arts and culture policy since its inception in 1947. So I will take your money for the, for the new and the NEA and ask how much money has the CIA spent in the arts. Give us that. Let's, let's, let's see what we can do with that. Uh, because they, if, if an organization that powerful and that strong that is working across the world sees the importance and the power of the tool of art and culture as essential to its ability to shape policy and culture around the, around the globe, then, then the fact that they don't fund the NEA is an intentional act. It's not an oversight or a fact that they don't know and understand. 
It is a very intentional act to say that we will not support the public using this tool to the same level at which we want to exploit it. So I think that's really important for us to think about. Um, some of the names that came out uh, were, were people like uh, Naya Watkins, Hollis Watkins, I want to bring him into the space, um, people like Linda Paris Bailey, Alice Lovelace, um, Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan. Um, you know, these are the people, you know, it included John in this patch and, and Kalamu. Uh, these are the people who helped me to shape my understanding of how I could use my art as a tool and how I was, you know, really integrated me into a process of understanding what it means to engage community. And, it's, and as John says, all work, all artistic work comes from community. But it goes back to what values are within that community that you're, that you're dealing with. Uh, is there transparency there? Are there values of inclusion and diversity that exist in those spaces that allow you to really do work that is important and uplifting? Um, John has informed a lot of my work personally with my brother. Our group is called Mugabe and we do um, work, we do whatever we need to do. We don't call ourselves anything in particular, but we do whatever we need to do. And I think learning from John uh, about the story circle process and how we can um, employ that, not just as a, a tactic to develop and create artistic work, but as a framework to build democracy within communities. Um, that we've used that in all of our work uh, for the last decade. It's been a tremendous tool for us to use. Um, most recently, we were uh, privileged to be in a space uh, at Grant Makers in the Arts Conference in which um, we had about, we had program officers from foundations across the country um, engaged in a two-day workshop on race in which the Story Circle was our prime, uh, primary tool of, of organizing. Uh, and what was really interesting is that um, we found this is a project of, uh, also that was that was mentored by June Work Production, by John specifically, by Dudley, um, that is done by Mondo Bizarro and, and Mugabe. And the fact that we were in this space with people who control billions of dollars of assets, literally billions of dollars they move into the arts, um, and that we were having a conversation about race uh, with two Southern companies uh, was really I, it's due to the work that John and Dudley and other people in this room have done for decades. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, thing to acknowledge in the legacy there. I just want to call out a few names of some contemporary uh, artists that I think are doing work that is very much steeped in, in the aesthetic. Um, uh, Sonny Patterson, um, who I think is commissioned by Jim Bud to do a new work, uh, who was on the Arsenio Hall show a couple of weeks ago performing with Two Chains. Um, you know, that's just, you know, that's, that's real, you know, she's, she comes out of this community, Saeed Khali, who travels the world as a photojournalist, um, capturing, capturing the beauty of African people and people of the African diaspora, um, and, and, and using that as a conversation starter to, to bring beauty back, to ownership of beauty back to the African American community, realizing that there's so much self-hate, and that that self-hate is such a root cause of, of our inability to come together and, and create collective action. Um, of course, think about people like uh, Millicent Johnny, um, also another Louisiana sister, um, choreographer who's also trained with uh, urban bushwomen and is doing amazing work. She's currently working with the Cry E1 work here in, in, um, in, in New Orleans with Mono Bazaar and Art Spot Production. Um, I think about people like Progress Theater. Um, which is, you'll see some work from Progress tonight. I'm working with them on a current production. Um, and I think, you know, they are embodying the African-American theater aesthetic to its fullest, uh, not dodging hard questions. They're taking it on full force, and the work is carefully thought out and well devised. Um, I think about people like Universes, um, who did a piece here in uh, New Orleans about uh, violence and about Hurricane Katrina called Maryville. Um, but what's interesting to me is that their ability to, to, to get a commission to do a project uh, at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and got $300,000 to produce a play about the Black, Panther, the, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords. You know, I, I look at that work as an extension of, of, of the Free Southern Theater because the fact that these stories are being acknowledged on that type of stage to get that type of budget is really important. Uh, and then I think last, uh, I would just say, uh, people like Mark Babuti Joseph, um, the Astor Gates, um, and just the, the myriad of students that have come through the Free Southern Theater Institute. 
um, all give light to the continuing, continuing legacy of this work, that the work isn't dead, it's not dying, it is very much alive and well, and the fact that it's not more robust than it is, is an intentional act of under-resourcing uh, and, and divesting of resources from communities of color uh, and communities that are asking the real hard questions. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves sometimes, um, what is our response to that? Do we continue to push down those roads and, and push the hard questions even though we know that you know, we, we then end up on the watch list and you know, our conversation being recorded, or every conversation we have being recorded, uh, every transaction we have uh, with, with another human being being stashed away and stored to be used against you in a further date. Um, it's a really important time in our history and we need more organizations like the Free Southern Theater. We need more communities of color working together with their communities to tell the, the stories that are not being heard um, and elevating the voices that have been left behind. Thank you. We could do this two ways. We could go back down and see if you guys have any want to respond to each other, or also if there's audience members who have pressing questions, I'd love it if you would just come up and, and help us get started with the dialogue. So um, I, what I'm really sitting with right now is the fact, I'm Karen Atlas, Arts and Democracy Project, um, how we heard about the theaters that were no longer in existence in the first panel, what you just said, Carlton, and Columbia, what you said about um, when you speak the truth, you don't get the support. So how can we support work that gets asked the hard questions? Uh, is there a way that we can support one another more financially as well as in spirit? Um, what, ha what are your ideas about how we can do the kind of work that we need to do that speaks the truth and support it in a way that is more um, authentic to the work? Well, it's, it's, no, it's no mystery. I say, for instance, take a bear with me, I'm going to go around the block to answer the questions right across the street. <laughs> there are people in this society that argue that classical music is the highest form of musical expression. Classical music is dying right now because they can't get nobody in the audience to listen to it. They can get support from the powers that be, but they can't, people are, you know. We always used to say, if classical music had to survive like jazz survived, it had been dead a long time ago. The question that you ask, Karen, is, is, is an important question, but it begs, where do we put whatever legal resources we have available to us? What do we support? Whoever we may be, those of us in this room, I bet you take it as an aggregate, myself included, we have supported more bullshit with our dollars than we have truth telling. Because in this American society, that's, we need drugs of one song, form, fashion, or another just to make it through the damn day here. And art becomes just another drug. I'm saying I'm going around the corner. Y'all see this way around the corner, but, but check this out now. We will spend money on bullshit and then talk about we need money for real things. That used to be the recipe for talking about Negroes, right? They buy what they want and beg for what they need. Y'all remember that? Hello. 
if we need real art, if we really, really need it, we will, right? Rather than buy some of the clothes we buy, rather than support some of the ministers we support. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as, I guess as a sort of cultural historian hat, I'd say one thing though, that's worth thinking about, which is, uh, and it's not something that you can manufacture easily, but you know, what, what was, uh, and I don't want to get into uh, some kind of old school base and superstructure kind of thing, but uh, one thing that was different is there was a mass political movement, or, an, or a number of interlocking mass political movements which, uh, as people said in the first panel, both inspired, help inspire people to do stuff in a certain kind of way and engage and struggle in a certain kind of way and also help provide uh, audience, kind of circuits of transmission, of getting it to people in a way that uh, at this moment there are different people doing different kinds of things. We don't have at this, at this moment. So, you know, uh, I don't think, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't think that theater as a rule is going to produce a political movement, but, you know, political movements, mass movements, where you have the potential for mass audiences, uh, changes, uh, changes things. And I think that that's something that's, that's at least worth thinking about historically, if you're looking to create the kinds of theaters uh, performance groups, poetry collectives, and you know, really, you you know, the, all of the above. I think I really liked in the first part saying, "Well, why did you get into the theater? It seemed like a place where we could do everything, generically," and they did. And uh, I think that that would be one other sort of key is like thinking about, okay, I mean, besides the fact that obviously we need some political changes if you want art that does the kinds of things that FST did or tried to do or wanted to do or aspired to do, then you need something, you know, the social basis on which to do it. Thank you. You have another question, Dr. Ward? Is there one person in this world who's under the age of 16. Well, I, asked this, I asked this because uh, I know very much what Columbus does with students at the center. And uh, it seems, it, it was a I don't know, it's something I'm agonizing over, perhaps needless. But I don't know how we're going to do anything meaningful with whatever we do. If we don't involve someone who is 15 and above, or even younger, I mean, as if we're thinking, all of this is wonderful. We're getting the history of FSG. But I think this is fabulous. But where is the brilliant <coughs> young woman or young man in New Orleans today who could profit from hearing the elders and the youngsters talk about FSG? They are not here. And I'd like to hear how each member of the panel feels about that. I mean, what does it feel? I mean, that's the reality. The question is, do we agree with the reality? And if we agree with it, fine. If we don't agree with what we're going to do to change it. That's always been the question. I mean, that's, that's the fundamental question we have to ask ourselves as human beings, right? And for those of us who consider ourselves artists, 
That's the fundamental question of art. What is the social reality? Do you love it or change it? You know, how you deal with it? That's, and, and one of the questions that you're asking has to do with the very structure of how this conference is set up because it was not set up to, uh, to bring into the conversation people who are students. I'm not saying that it was set up to exclude them, but it was not set up specifically to make that happen. But we talk all the time about how you're gonna do certain things. Well, you have to, if you want certain outcomes, you got to create certain end goals. So how do you access certain things? If you want to see certain things come out, how do you set it up so that those elements that are necessary access that? And I think that the, the question, Jerry, you just being provocative, you come out of Dillard and Tougaloo, you know. You know. I come out of Tougaloo. Yeah, you come out of Tougaloo, you retire from Dillard. Don't, 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 don't try and, and, I and distance work, yourself. And I now work in China, the of the world. <laughs> Run all the way to China if you want, but don't, you don't distance yourself from the question. <laughs> uh, it's the same question for, for all of us. I, I, uh, I want to take, since I got the mic, John, I want to publicly thank you for one thing. And if anybody knows anybody, if anybody knows anything about the history of FST, you know that John and I often ended up on different ends of some of these battles we had. But what you did in codifying the process that we developed, that later became known as the Story Circle. That process came out of a conscious effort for how is it when we have discussions after we do the plays that we can involve everybody in the discussion and not just have one or two people doing all the talking. And that was a conscious, I want, I want you know, I want to pass that on. That was a conscious effort made to develop that and John was the one who figured out how to codify, how to codify all of the, 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 the results, you might say, of the efforts we had over the years at that. And if there's one single thing that I think FST should be remembered for, it's the story circle. All other stuff, everybody else can point to, they did, stuff. they did something like that here, they did something like that over there, so forth and so on. You know, they brought plays and then, you know, mobile into the cotton fields and the coal mines and all like that. Ain't nobody else did story circles develop that, that whole technique. And I think, John, thank you for that. And, and just to add that, I mean, I think Dr. Ward's question is, um, you know, I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I've been in a story circle with youth. So it's a way in which on a daily practice here in New Orleans and in many other places, the values are being shared um, in classrooms and, with, and in all kinds of other ways with um, not just high school students and elementary school students, but college students, um, new teachers, um, just, it's just kind of everywhere. So, thank you. Uh, yes, since you asked everyone to respond, yes, it's, it's totally important to have younger people and we know how important it is to hear firsthand what it is to actually hear the people who went through it, that's invaluable. Um, at, but since that's not how this was set up, um, I, I, in a way I'm echoing you in saying there's all these multipliers in the room. And that's really important that we have distributive leadership, as Ella Baker said, that, that we go out into the high schools, we sit in the story circles, we work in neighborhoods, and that it is being passed on. It, this, this isn't the only opportunity as, as rich and important as it is to hear firsthand, but there's so many other platforms now that's part of the legacy, that, that where this kind of work can pass on, there are many, many different kinds of organizations. Yeah, I would just, I would just say that, you know, um, you know, the absence is definitely felt, and it's important for us to make sure that young people are in all spaces that we're in. And I recognize the hard work that was done to try to put this event together and working on a less than shoestring budget um, to produce something of you know, And this is part of the resources of our work that, that causes us to miss huge chunks of what it should be 
um, and consistently have those gaps over time because we don't have, and it's not, resources not even about just money, but it's about human capital, it's about having you know, the time, having the partnerships and the, the relationships to where this, you know, we're at a university, there's, there's a, tons of teenagers running in and out of this building all day, most of which have no idea what's going on in this room or even the people that are in here or even how important this is to the history of, of New Orleans. And you know, part of that is about marketing, part of that is about you know, having, having partners at the university that can help to steer people in here. And, and so there's just a lot of work that, that it takes to do all of that. And I think you know, we're just recognizing that it took a lot of work to even get this part of it done. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. How do we make sure that the next time we do something, whatever it is, that we don't miss the step? And maybe, again, if I can be the academic historian type, is, you know, thinking back in the day, this might be the, the Marxist in me coming out also um, in terms of a kind of dialectic is, you know, if we're talking about free Southern theater in 1963-64, we're talking about young people. And what we're talking about, we heard, uh, we heard John, we heard uh, O'Neill, we heard Doris Derby, we heard uh, a number of folks saying that, you know, the sort of just do it philosophy, we're in the movement, we see a need, we're not going to wait around and do it. And that was one side. We saw, you saw that politically in the moment, we saw that, you, you saw that uh, cultural, or you couldn't separate the two, but both things going on at the same time. I think that was one side of the dialectic when it worked best. The other side of the dialectic is that there were a lot of elders around. They weren't all hostile, but a lot of them, you know, people like Langston Hughes, people like Sterling Brown, people like Margaret Walker, people like Gwendolyn Brooks, people like Dudley Randall, these are all people from an earlier generation who got involved in the movement to one degree or the another, Theodore Ward. And they set themselves up, I think they were supportive, but as critical supporters, they thought it was very, in many cases, important to remind the young folks that things didn't start in 1963 or 64, 65 or 66, but there was a long history of struggle. Some of the younger people were more cognizant of that than others, but they reminded it. And I think that that, that was the dialectic that it worked best. So what Kalam was saying is like, it would be great, you know, how do I feel that there are no young, few young people here, and, and certainly not many college age people here, uh, I feel bad. Uh, but that, uh, you know, that was at its best. The other thing though I think that's worth remembering though as, as a historian is, you know, the problems that we have now, uh, there was a mass movement, but that are not unique. And again, it requires some conscious work to do it. If you go back and look at the first Fisk Writers Workshop, which was an important event in 66, I guess it was, at Fisk University that was organized by John O. Killens. There were no young people there. Or Mel, William Melvin Kelly was the only young person of the younger generation of black writers there, people like Leroy Jones, Amiri Baraka, all these new folks who were coming out much less uh, the folks in Free Southern Theater, they simply weren't invited. It wasn't until the next year that they, they got there. So the problems that we're facing now uh, are not unique to this moment, and it required a certain kind of conscious effort in 67 and 68 to bring these younger folks, Haki, Mata, Budi, um, you know, uh, to a lot of more, you know, Ochoari, Mini, those folks, uh, to these, to these things. Thanks, we got one now. Questions, any other questions? Yeah, you Anybody speak to the content of some of the theater cool. back then? Um, Money, could you come up to the mic, just because we're, um, it's live streaming, so it'd be great if you could say it into there. Um, so the dialogue so far has been about the fact that theater has been created. Can any of you speak about the content of theater, either in your generation or the contemporary moment? Thank you. I'm not sure I when you said content of theater, what do you mean? What are, what are the plays about now? 
what were they about then? What are they about now? What should we what what should we be creating work about? And I'd also be interested in hearing about form as well, you know, because one of the things that FSD had an impact on is not just changing the content of what was written and who was writing and producing plays, but the form in which they were produced as well. It's still the best I have to get to a funeral, and I would like to, uh, it seems you could give me a minute to speak to my friend John and say thanks to my friend. I remember one night we were in Clarkdale, Mississippi. And we were wrestling with the lady who spoke about content. Mic, spoke about content. Use the mic, though. I don't like to dance in front of the mic, but I'll try. But, but, but I want to speak about some things here. Theater as a word is a prescriptive term that came, is gen was generated in the dictionary that we had nothing to do with. The term compromises our existence as creative people. Now, one of the things that I was impressed with, that we put our hearts and feet in the dust, and we made an emotional discovery. And on that night in Clark's day, Brother John gave it a form. We did not have a language because the language was prescriptive. The techniques was born out another definition of value. See, there's something about our existence that transcends certain details that we have nothing to do with about creating. I think when he made those steps in that mud in Mississippi and other places, we made a discovery of self. And we, he was able to use a foreign instrument to speak to our originality as it relates to the symbolic definition of word, movement, and shape. And that did not come from schools that certified and that run with initials. It's not there. It comes from a ritualization of spirit that's not defined by the word ritual. Because we don't know the word, but we do know the feeling. Thank you, John. content of the work, um, you know, the people that, I, that I'm talking about, um, the content is about, it's about building, um, deconstructing the, the negative connotations of who we are and our identity, elevating culture, uh, restoring a sense of value and restoring a sense of, of understanding to um, the stories that are not being told in the mainstream. So like, there's spaces for all types of stories, but most of that that most of that that broadband space is being taken up by the dominant culture. So the stories that are that are are happening, but are not being elevated to that level, are the stories that I think the people that I was talking about are telling. Um, so it frames a different narrative of the Black experience, um, of the Latino experience in America. It it uses you know in terms of form, it's all forms, it's dance, it's it's, it's theater for the stage, it's, it's community engagement. People like Ebony Golden, her work with Body Ecology, uh, is about you know um, radical transformation of, of, the, of the female body in its form and how that looks in public space. Um, you know, it's it's all it's music, it's poetry, it's it's photos, it's it's all types of, 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 of forms of communication. But I think the most important part is that the content is rooted in in a love of self and a love of their culture and a love of the community they come from, and a, and a desire to engage and, and work with other communities so that they can understand how to use those same tools to love themselves as well. 
Um, Y'all can tell I like to go around a lot. But I, I just, that question about content opens up a discussion that, that uh, some of us were deeply engaged in free Southern theater. The question of aesthetics as a whole, what do you mean by beautiful? What do you mean by good? The content's gonna be whatever we, we're thinking about, whatever we're dealing with at any given moment. But how we express that becomes the aesthetic. <coughs> what form does our content take? What form will we deem as sufficient or desirable to present our content to our audience? Who will be the audience to receive this content and how, how do you go about doing it? So one of the things I can tell you from the period I was with the Free Southern Theater, we very quickly came to the understanding that the American stage was dead. And that plays as they were being taught to us was not what we wanted to do. So we would often, I mean, we had all kinds of battles about this. We didn't necessarily clearly understand it all. And, and much of this, what I'm saying to you now, is in retrospect, I can see more clearly because I'm away from it, a distance from it. But we wanted to go into, like, we come into a space like this, and we look around and check out the audience and shape whatever we were going to present, given what the audience was. We didn't feel that there was a content that in and of itself was so excellent that everybody had to dig it, or was capable of digging it. You understand what I'm saying? So we would say, hey, if our work is about working with people, then you need to look at the people you're working with to decide what kind of work you're going to put it out there and how you're going to present it. This made it seem I don't know if you fully understand the, the technical stuff that, and, the, and, the, and the aesthetic questions that are being reared by this, but this made a big ass difference in terms of what you do. So if Black Art South was to do a production, I mean, do a presentation here at the time we were represent, we come in here, we look around and we see, well, that's who that is, okay. Well, we're gonna do this part and that and so forth and so on. And if we were in a different space with a whole different audience, we'd have to tailor it for that. Well, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot develop the immediacy of now with an Aristotelian mimetic logic. You cannot develop what we used to call the jazz aesthetic, the immediacy of now working in the now with the audience that you have, the instruments that you have, the ideas that you have, working in the now. You cannot do that with the Aristotelian notion that what you're simply doing is perfecting the reflection of something that pre-existed. What we wanted to do could not exist before we did it. Couldn't put that shit on paper because it did because he had to have part of it had to be an interaction of the moment. This was a radical, this was a radical change. That's why, that is why the version of slave ship that Gilbert Moses mounted on Broadway never had quite the impact that slave ship. In Clarksdale, Mississippi, had. Tell him, John. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Never kept, and, and some people say, well, what was the difference? It was the same play. It was not the same play. It used some of the same elements, but it was not the same play. There was a different aesthetic at work. And these aesthetic questions. I, don't, I, I haven't seen many people want to discuss them or get deep into them, and now is not the time right now because, you know, I mean, this conference, you know, this panel is not set up to do it. But at some point, it might be nice to have some of these discussions because some of us are prepared to intellectually challenge the Aristotelian notion 
you know, and you know, bring up, you might call it the cold training or uh, whatever, but you know, it's, <laughs> this is another, <laughs> you know, my favorite thing is the same song, but it's got some different things I'm in favor of. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Yo, do do y'all really understand the, the, the impact of that? Yes. You know, I mean, it completely changes everything. And that impact, so that for us, theater, and, and, and Duck was getting to it, theater was no longer doing a play. It was a call and response. Yes, yeah, right. It had, but it had to be in the now. It had to work with, you know, so forth. And you had to use forms that your audience could deal with. Because the master's tools will never dismantle the master. Well, any tool can dismantle the house. I agree with, I agree with Audrey Law when she was saying, if that's what you're going to do, just go up in the house. But believe me, give me a hammer. That could, I don't care who, who, whose tool it was. Give me a hammer. I can use it. And how you use the tool is, is critical, right? The master's thinking will not allow you to dismantle the master's house because once you dismantle it, all you're going to do is build another master house until you change your whole approach to what's living. Maybe we don't need houses, maybe we need compounds or whatever. It's that master's thinking and that, that thinking, see they always told you that we didn't have any theoretical development. What it was is the theoretical development we had was totally deconstructing that bullshit that they were trying to tell us was theory. <laughs> and some of us were ready to engage on that level. But you're not gonna hear, you're not gonna hear. Bring me somebody who wants to talk about theater, bring me somebody. We'll have a discussion about Aristotelian the logic of, of, of drama and tragedy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where's the tragedy? We do not have fatal flaws just by being beyond human. That is the ultimate aspect of tragedy. They always told me, man, you're doing some Brechtian shit. I said, I'm Brecht. You know, I didn't know who Brecht was. I've sub subsequently learned who he is and have a lot of respect for who he was and what he was talking about. But what I was doing was coming out of a community of people. And see, when you understand that what your people is doing is hipper than what they're doing on Broadway already, you have a different view of all of that shit. It changes your mind. Your whole, I mean, they ain't Broadway ain't got nothing for, for for New Orleans on a Saturday night? <laughs> Question, Derek? John Chuck is over there. Must be time for the door. <laughs> not yet, not quite. Almost. Eight more minutes. So I, I don't know if this is a question that there is an answer to. Um, but maybe that's good. Um, I, I just, in this conversation about culture in New Orleans and, and resistance and this history, and seeing everybody in this room, people who are coming from out of town to, to support this history and, and celebrate it, and, and, and people who have, who have been a part of it, um, I'm just sitting here thinking about, as somebody who is really trying to do um, some um, do some education justice work in New Orleans. Um, there's, you know, there's 50 some districts right now in New Orleans. Um, kids are being, you know, dismantled from their communities. Um, we have a choice district here, so so schools are, um, you know, there aren't any community schools left. Like, you, there's a quota. You can't go. They, you can't if you live next to a school. Actually, you. In most cases, you can't go to that school. You have to get bused across the city, and and so so the kinds of relationships and community um, power that that you know are so much a part of the culture that we're celebrating right now are being totally destroyed, like right right around us, and um, and campuses like this are 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 fueling um, projects, putting people 
who, who, who have no training, essentially, in education, no legitimate training, five weeks of, of training. I know it because I I'm, was one of these Teach for America teachers. Um, and, they're, and they're populating most of the classrooms in the city. So there's, I don't need to go on too much, but, but there's, there's amazing young people. Um, and thankfully, there are some projects, like Students at the Center, which Palamu is, you know, um, but there's, there's tons and tons of kids who are just dollar signs, just dollar signs to tons of people in, in the city who are, who are coming down here and making money. And I just, um, I just felt like I, I need to put that into the space for people who are excited about celebrating this history and, and, and thinking about struggle. Um, if you care about this, like, we, we really need um, as much support as we can. I know there's already support in the room, but I just want to make sure that, that we're talking about the, it's like, it's beyond a human rights kind of violation. Like it's, it's, it's like ethnic cleansing right now. We're moving, we're pushing entire populations of people out of the city and making it into a completely different city. And it's, um, it's disgusting and disturbing and I just, I want us all to be really talking about, about what's happening with this with these young people, and I mean, it's, you know, okay, so I'm done. <laughs> um, so let's figure that out. That's well, a question? I don't know. Just to turn, like, to add to that, I mean, I think, I, I'm so glad you brought that into the room, because that's the reality. And that was kind of the only question that I had for you guys today was, you know, what, given the state that we're in now, especially in New Orleans, where communities are being, from every possible angle, dismantled, the African American communities in this city, dismantled, pushed out, um, colonized, um, killed, put in jail, you can name, name it. Um, what's the relationship of theater to that today? And, and, and what can theater do? Can theater do anything? Yeah. Uh, some of my theater friends, have never forgiven me for saying I'm done with it. I left it a long time ago. Never looked back. I've not written a play. And I, I might point out that I'm somebody, by, you can tell by my personality, you can tell by my presentation, that I don't give a shit about whether I make it or not within the system. But I'm somebody who had that opportunity put out there. Like I remember talking to Mary who was saying, you know, after the Dutchman came out, they opened up this young boy and they had a mountain of money with a white, naked white woman on top of it saying, all you had to do is <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's, that's essentially what they want us to do, to get caught in the trap. I don't care about them. I care about people. And I understand that their theater, once you start caring about their theater, you are on a, 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 a pathway that leads you away from the people. So theater was not the issue. I didn't get into the theater for the theater of it. I got into the theater because I wanted to express certain things in the context of my people. Right? And I will I refuse, I refuse to spend even one second figuring out how to defend theater, how to keep theater, anything thing going. It's about the people. And we have to keep putting people at the forefront. And that's why, that is why, as far as the aesthetic goes, poetry lives while theater dies. Why? Because the poetry remains in the now. This theater stuff is caught up in the past. And in every community in the United States, you can go, you can find poetry going on in the live sense and theater's dying. And the people in theater, you need to look at that. To me, the thing about theater that does sustain and contribute to the kind, the kind of situation you just talked about, it's, it's when we apply the skills we use to make theater, but the product doesn't have to be theater. 
So like in theater, we know how to do story circles. That doesn't have to end in a play. We know how to get people to participate and feel like everyone ha has the authority of their experience, they're equal. We know how to use theater, to, as, as, as you so well said, both to, to see that you've got something and that you're perfect. You come from a culture that has something. And so I think we need to, to separate theater as plays, the product, from the theater skills and craft, which I find endlessly valuable. And I find them especially valuable in partnerships. Who is it who knows something I don't know, who's doing work I think is really worthwhile, how could I bring these skills to work with them? That's, that's, that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, I would just say that in, in terms of theater, just like Columbus said, in any other art form, um, they are all part of a capitalist structure. So they, uh, the outcome is tethered to a bottom line, is tethered to your finances, whether or not you can, you know, theaters have died not because the work they're doing is irrelevant, but because they have not found the business model that works for them to, to thrive in this economy. So it's about the dollars, and the dollars is what turns the wheels and makes sure the doors open and all that stuff. And, and there's a very clear structure that is supporting theater on a, in a tremendous scale um, that is alive and well and, and doing great, but they're not doing anything to change that structure. Um, so, you know, one of the greatest examples, you know, people say, well, black folks don't go to theater. And I'm like, you must be out of your mind. I mean, Tyler Perry had black folks sitting at home watching theater on bootleg DVDs. <laughs> bootleg DVD, bad copies. <laughs> you know, folks that don't ever go to theater, sitting at home watching bad bootleg DVDs of Chip and Circuit plays written by Tyler Perry. Because they found something in it that spoke to them. So it's not that the art form at all is, is dead, it's just that all of these art forms are tethered to a business model that is a representation of capitalism. And so it works for the capitalists. You know, those people that are willing to make huge investments and build Spider-Mans and build, you know, these huge Broadway shows and get people to come in at $240 a, a seat, it works for them. You know, but in terms of is it transforming our communities? Are we use, how are we using the tools that we learn in any art form, whether it be poetry, theater, uh, television, the web, mass communications, photojournalism, any of those things, how are we using them to transform our situation? That's the question. That's anything. How are we using these things to transform our situation? So I, you know, I don't call myself a theater artist. I don't really call myself a musician or a poet. You know, I do whatever it takes to get a point across. So my aesthetic is, is whatever the medium I need to tell the, the particular story I need to tell at that moment. Um, and it comes out in many different forms. And I hadn't made a whole lot of money, and I guess that's why. <laughs> I guess the part that I'm interested in, I mean, when you start talking about education and, and the destruction of public schools and so forth uh, here in New Orleans, which you know, in a lot of places, uh, there's a lot of things you could say about, but what I, you know, was taken away from that and hearing some of the other folks is thinking about the question of, of cultural memory, of historical memory and community, and what, what, does, what does it do, how important it is. I mean, one of the things you have to say about what's happened in New Orleans, you know, from post-Katrina, is that um, in, in, in New Orleans, something happened very dramatically, very, you know, I'm saying tragically, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of destruction of community, uh, disruption of culture and cultural memory happened here in a very dramatic way. But the fact of the matter is, all across the United States, particularly in African American communities, this very same thing is going on, even though they haven't had a hurricane. I just got, uh, was down in Jacksonville, Florida a, a few weeks ago, a place I used to live in. And well, they do get hurricanes in Jacksonville, but there was no catastrophic hurricane that flooded uh, La Villa, the center, historical center of uh, black Jacksonville. But it's just as destroyed as you can possibly imagine, just like Beale Street has become a kind of theme park just like Auburn Avenue is a shell of itself, just like West Baltimore is, is the subject of what I consider to be kind of uh, dramatic pornography in, in the wire, or, or what have you, and that, that, that sort of a certain kind of 
that mean black people still live in those cities, but when people are dispersed, when the institutions are destroyed and so forth, it does it does something. So what I, I don't know about theater, I, I mean theater is just one possible way, but there's all kinds of expressive culture, it could be bounce even, which is trying to think about how does one maintain something, capture something, get a hold of something, of some kind of cultural history, historical memories. Or like uh, what Kalamu was doing a few years ago, though it's morphed, I think, in, into uh, a different project, but his Listen to the People project of trying to think about, well, in the destruction of so much here in New Orleans, uh, black, just not, not just black New Orleans, but especially black New Orleans, and try to tell young folks, well, what was it like to live here before the, uh, as someone said, significant parts of the city were destroyed or ethnically cleansed, which actually only continued a project, a, a process that had already been going on here and has gone on in all kinds of places where there, like I said, like in Jacksonville, there, La Villa wasn't knocked down by a hurricane. La Villa was knocked down by the city of Jacksonville. Uh, before, one of the complications. You can be our last comment, okay? Last <laughs> call. <laughs> one of the complications. No, I never wanted to, and I don't think any of the artists whom I worked with wanted to be put into any box, any one box, whatever that may be, even if it was a revolutionary box. Because sometimes we felt like being silly. You know? Like you say, sometimes I feel like a nut, sometimes I don't. You know? And, <laughs> and you wanted that you wanted that freedom. That's what you really wanted, that freedom to be able to express the fullness of your humanity, which includes sometimes being silly, you know? So I, I would hope that people understand that from my comments, even though I take the hard line, that's not the only line. I can jump on some other stuff, you know, and do some other things too, and, and welcome those other things being done. That, and that, that's what is frightening about the United States today, is that whoever's in charge, they're always trying to give you one line to walk. And that's not human. You understand what I'm saying? That's just not, it's just not human. So, whereas I might talk about the immediacy of the now and so forth and so on, I also make movements. And there ain't nothing immediate about making movements. That's a different aesthetic. And it has a different value, and it has a value in and of itself that can be useful, right? But it's not the same as theater. We just happen to be talking about theater. I just don't want people to leave here thinking that you know, Kalamu was saying all the, you know, all the art's got to be this way, so forth and so on. Because I do some other kind of stuff, and I understand that, and it all has value. And we just need to be not afraid of freedom, whether we're talking about gender freedom, right? Putting women in charge, and that's, that's the issue that I wish we'd bring up, you know, in terms of the FST. Out of two dudes, outvoted Doris, and said we, and said we got to go to New Orleans. You know, you understand and why and so forth and so on, and why Doris didn't want to go to New Orleans and to talk and really investigate that and so forth. So I'm glad they came to New Orleans because that's you know how I got hooked up with them. But I so don't misunderstand me. But there's a reality there, and people talk about it time to time, but I think we should need to investigate it directly. The role that women play in the development of everything has often been, there have been major attempts to erase that. Erase it. Because the American system of capitalism, the superstructure that we labor under, does not want to have women in charge of shit. That's a perfect segue into our next panel, which is the women of the FFP and the Civil Rights Movement. So thank you guys so much for being here. So we'll start the next panel promptly at 3.30. So you have a few minutes.
but not very long. So stretch and go to the bathroom, and we'll see you right back here.